Good morning. Thank you for being here this morning. I am excited to be here and to worship with you this morning. Much, much beautiful day today. Yesterday was a great day, though, but it's definitely a little bit nicer outside than yesterday, right? Who was it that I was walking? Was that Lois? Well, that was you, wasn't it? When I was walking in, told me that it was a better day than yesterday. So, yeah, it was beautiful out today. Thank you. So I do have a couple announcements this morning. The first one is on October 17th, there will be a district pastors meeting. We're going to start trying to do a district pastors meeting, and we're going to meet here in Ishpeming because we're kind of the central location for the four different pastors that are in our district. So on that 17th, I'm looking for somebody who would like to volunteer to provide lunch for the pastors at noon. Um, so if you would like to be the person to volunteer to, to do that, then come and let me know. Usually how I ask for volunteers is I'll make an announcement, and then if I don't hear anything, then I start going to person to person. So if I come to you and ask you face to face, you know that I haven't had anybody offer yet. So I would like to call on Anne. She has one announcement that she would like to give, and, and then we'll, we will begin our service. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, through our work, our volunteer work at the hospital, Ray and I have noticed that the chapel at Bell Hospital has been neglected for, for some time. And I think this goes back to pre-COVID. There hasn't been a lot going on in there. Um, we usually go in there, we work one day a week, and we go in and, and check the prayer journal and the prayer box. And then we bring those names back to our Sunday school class and pray for them in our Sunday school class. But we did notice that no one else has been looking at them or checking on them. So for that reason, we're kind of taking on the project of making Bell Hospital's chapel a, a place of prayer for people who need it. We've had several local pastors, including Pastor Steve, who have volunteered to spend half an hour of their time uh, in the chapel praying and being available for anyone who needs them but we are also hoping to get a group of people together who would like to be prayer companions. As a prayer companion, you would just come into the chapel on the, on the day and time that you've chosen, and you would pray for whoever is in the journal or in the prayer box, and also you would be available if anyone has asked for someone to pray with them. Um, it would mean that you would have to commit at least 15 minutes on a regular basis on any day that you choose. You can commit to more than 15 minutes if you want, but you get to choose the day. Um, for instance, you could choose to commit to every Monday, the first of every month, every other week, whatever fits best in your schedule, and you can choose however much time you want to spend there. We'll have signs in all of the waiting rooms throughout the hospital and, and in the lobby stating what times people are going to be available in the chapel for prayer. And just wanted to point out it's a new program, so you may go a whole year without ever seeing anybody, but at least you would be able to pray for those who have prayer requests in the chapel. So if you're interested in being a prayer companion um, or you have any questions, you can talk to Raymond and I if you want to volunteer for a time. We have a, a calendar and we can, we can get you signed up right away. Thank you. So it was a couple weeks ago when Ann came into the office to, to tell me about this. And what had happened is they had opened up the prayer box there where people put the prayers in. And there had been one, it was what, two months old or three months old? Two years? Wow, I thought, it was, I thought it was this year. I didn't realize it was a year ago. Anyway, that nobody had opened the box up, taken that prayer request, and prayed for it. And so those people are pouring out uh, their need. And then there was, and, and I don't think that God ignores that need because it didn't get prayed for. But, but boy, wouldn't that be something that, I would, be, I would be saddened in my own heart if I found out that something that I needed prayer for and I put in a box to be prayed for was never, ever prayed for. That would be, 
So that's uh, how this kind of started for them. They're God laying that on their heart. So uh, I would like to see us, uh, if you have the ability to do that, if you are a person who is gifted in prayer, that's something that God has gifted you in. This is an opportunity for you to to use that gift for, for God's glory that's outside of our congregation and yet is important among the community. So we will begin our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, join together in prayer as we begin. Jesus, we give this time to you. We ask that you would glorify yourself in it, that you would hear our petitions, that you would hear our praise, that as we lift up our hands and our hearts to you, Lord God, that you would move and be among us. That here, Lord Jesus, you would find free reign. And that in that, our hearts would be strengthened. Our faith would be kindled. May it be, Lord Jesus, that we enjoy your presence. That we long for it. That we don't just search and hunger after righteousness, Lord God, but that we search and hunger after your very heart. We are yours, and we know that you are ours. So this time is yours, Jesus. Do with it as you wish. In your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. Let us begin by singing together our opening hymn, Beautiful Savior. Let us join together in our hearts as we continue worshiping by confessing our sins with the confession found on the screen. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. Amen. O Lord, God, Heavenly Father, you who have no pleasure in death of the wicked, but that they turn from their ways and live, we pray that you, 
would be merciful, avert the punishment that our sins deserve. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. We'll call on the scripture reader at this time. Please be seated. And then they're going to... Morning. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day, the breath you have given us, and the many blessings you have granted to each of us. Each day, may we rise with grateful hearts and lift up our praises to you. Father, let us never forget to use the blessings you have given us to bless others be it physical resources or uplifting words and prayers for others in need. Lord Jesus, be with Pastor Steve today as he shares your message with us, and may we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit to work within us to receive this message into our hearts and minds. Father, we come to you just as we are, imperfect and broken by sin. You created us. You meet us where we are, you, Jesus, have redeemed us through your suffering, death, and resurrection. We thank you and praise you for your gift of salvation. Father, we pray for all those ill, grieving, or weary. Lord, meet their needs even when they do not know the words to express them. Bring healing of body and spirit, and may they feel your presence, your comfort, and the joy of the Lord through your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we also rejoice with Keno and Jereen as they celebrated their 70th anniversary. We thank you for their testimony of commitment and love in marriage, but especially for their commitment to you. Father God, we praise you not only from our mountaintops, but even when we find ourselves in dark, lonely pits of frustration or despair. Even then, may our spirit be at work within us, strengthening us, encouraging us, and may our praises rise up to your throne. We ask all these things in your holy, precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please rise if you're able. The Old Testament lesson is found in Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And that's Amos chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Reading in Jesus' name. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure at the mountains of Samaria, and notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kelna and see, and from here go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Garth of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you, who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the ground, to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves in the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they, shall not, therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The epistle lesson is found in 1 Timothy, that's 1 Timothy, Chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Again, reading in Jesus' name. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. For those who desire to be rich fall in temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. 
It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Find the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in these presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession and to keep the commandments unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone have immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not for the haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to be good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of which is truly life. And the gospel lesson is found in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And that's Luke, begin, beginning at verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he, com he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides, all this between us and your great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they all come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead." Please join in the confession of faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended in heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Please be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. brought the bag look at that is it on the bag or is it on something in the bag oh there's something in there I didn't see anything I was like oh man I'm gonna do something on nothing can I take it thank you so much all right it smells unused what do we have it is a toothpick you guys ever see that? Yeah, I laugh. No. Did you guys ever see that one, that one uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon when you were a kid where they're making toothpicks and they take and they use the whole tree to make one <laughs> tiny toothpick? Can anybody remember that? So, we look at this and what's it used for? Okay. Anybody ever try to clean their teeth with a wooden toothpick and then they get part of the wooden toothpick stuck in their tooth? <laughs> That's happened to me. No, but we use it to poke out the, when you have pizza, the neighbor on pizza, so there's one pan on Oh. Oh, so you used to clean out the, the pan? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good idea. What were you going to say? check the inside of a cake off, how cakes we see. Oh, it. yeah. If it's gaudy, then we know that it's not. Yeah, that's right. That's a good idea, isn't it? You guys know how that works whenever, if, if your cake is or cupcakes aren't done and you poke it, then you pull it out. If it's not done, then part of the, the, the undone part will get stuck to the toothpick. So if it goes in and comes out clean, then you know that, the, that it's done. That's a good point. So there's a lot of different things you can use this for, right? So it's a tool, but what if it just stays in the bag? What then? Not a tool. <laughs> not, not a good tool, yeah. So it has to be available, doesn't it? Has to be available. What happens if it gets lost? Yeah. How many of you would care if the toothpick was lost? <laughs> if it was the last one, maybe? What were you? Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of them. So here's the thing. It needs to be available and it needs to be, you know, so that, that it can be used. But if it's lost, because there's a lot of them, it's kind of like whatever, right? Like, it's okay that it's lost. I'm really glad that our Lord doesn't treat us like that. Right? There's a lot of people, isn't there, in this world? Does anybody know about how many people there are? Was it 7 billion? Is that what it is? About 7 billion people on the world. So that's a lot of toothpicks. Right? And if one of them was lost, if it was up to us, we'd be like, wow, there's like plenty of other toothpicks. We don't need to worry about that one. But does God treat us like that? No. Oh. He cares about each one. Each one he cares. And each one is used differently. Is God limited to what we think we are designed for? Maybe you think you're designed for one thing, but maybe you're designed to be poked into cake to see if it's done or not. But in any case, if you get lost and you get kicked underneath the counter, he cares where you are. Do you see? You are important. And though to us, we all look the same, each and every one of us is important to God. You are important to God. But you want to know something else? It's not just being important to God. You're important 
to us. As we all stand back here and we look up there, each one of you is important to us. God says he has given us a future and a hope. And as we look forward, you are a part of that. Remember how important you are to God and then how important you are to us. Let's pray. Arms out. Arms together. Jesus, thank you for your tender mercy. Thank you for your desire that all men Women and children would come to the knowledge of the truth. Know us, Lord, so deeply and lead and guide each one that we would have faith and belief in you that is deep, that we too would be a tree that is firmly planted, that when the waves crash, we stand strong. Not just deep, but wide. Link us together, O oh Lord, as a family of believers. You, O oh Lord, being the cornerstone of who and whose we are. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Amen. Good one. Jordan. Has Charlie gone yet? Charlie, have you gone yet? All right, you're next week then, buddy. All right, kids, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. You did a great job. High fives for that one. Jordan. Well done. Jordan, your kids are going right now. Are your kids going? Levi, can you move over here? Thank you. Oh, Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? That you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish in the sea, everything that passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thursday night, I, uh, I couldn't sleep, um, and, and this happens sometimes, you know, for me, and sometimes I get fixed on different things, and things run in my head, and, I, and sometimes I can't get them out, and so here I was, I was laying down, and I was thinking, and thinking, and thinking, and 
And I said to myself, Lord, why, why do you allow me to act in such foolishness? Why do you allow me not to let go of this different things in my mind that I was fixated on and that allow myself not to rest? And then, as I was thinking on this particular situation that I'm dealing with, and my mind is like a Rubik's Cube, thinking of all different situations and trying to problem solve, and then I do that once, and then I do it again, and then I do it again, and, I, and so here I am thinking and thinking, and then there was a specific thought that came into my mind that it really felt like it was outside of me. It reminded me of something of how somebody treated me when I was younger and how God views me. And it changed my perspective on the thing that I was struggling with in my mind. And I looked at the clock and there was a specific time and then I was reminded of this message that I've given once before and though it's been refreshed to fit today, it's not the same text that was read from the gospel. I really feel like God wanted me to preach on this text instead, and so I got up. It was 3.30, I think, when I got in the office, and, and I rewrote this message because I think this is what God wanted me to speak on today. It's from Mark chapter 6. It's verses 45 through 52. Because it wasn't read already, I will read it again, though this version will be the New American Standard that I'm preaching from. So uh, it begins then in cha Mark chapter 6 starting with verse 45 and reading through 52. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Beth Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them. The wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Let's pray. Jesus, as we are confronted by you today, as we are reminded of your love and compassion, May it be that today is the day that our heart is not hardened. May it be, Lord Jesus, that we see of your great love. May we know the depth to which you go, that we can know how much you mean and how much we mean to you. Lord God, help us in our unbelief. Amen. It's always interesting to me when I spend time preparing a message and it's all done and I'm feeling comfortable and then God completely tells me to do something else. And I guess there's never a, never goes wasted, right? Never goes wasted. The word of God never, never is wasted when you spend time in it and so it's good. This is a, uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It starts before this. It goes, this is just after the feeding of the 5,000, which is just after the section of Scripture where after Jesus sends them all out two by two to go and prepare as he goes and teaches, then they all come back, and they're in this debriefing mode. They're talking about everything that happens, and, and they're going, 
Jesus, you won't believe it. Even the demons flee from us by your name. And he burst out in praise that they get to see that. And it says that they were, they were so busy, they didn't have time to eat or drink, and that the crowd was pressing in around them. And so Jesus says, let's go off to a secluded place. And so they leave by boat. And I know what that feels like. Those of you who are very busy, you know what that feels like, that time where you, need, you just need to get away for a minute. And then they go to get away, and as they're coming in from the sea where they were supposed to be secluded, the crowd had followed them on land and sees them coming in. And they go out into the water to receive the boat. And in that moment, I, I understand fully what the disciples would have felt like. Are you kidding me? Come on. But Jesus' response was different. He looks at them and he weeps. And he says they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he teaches them. And then it's time, the dark, it's getting late in the day, and the disciples, who were frustrated already, are like, send them away, we got no food, right? Get them out. And Jesus' response, and in, this is in two different Gospels, but in, the, in Mark, he's like, you feed them. You know, <laughs> I love Jesus. Give them some food. They're like, we don't got anything. So Jesus says, what do you have? And of course, then they get fed with the fish and the loaves that they had. and So this is at the very end of that. So Jesus is sending the crowd away. And Jesus knows that, the, that they're tired. And Jesus himself would have been tired. He was a man. His body would have been fatigued just like anybody else. The man, that he needed to sleep, didn't he? He couldn't have run 24 hours straight forever. He'd have been tired. And yet he had compassion. And he met the people where they were because their need was greater than his need. And he also understands the disciples. So he sends them out. He sends the disciples out. And he says goodbye to the crowd. And then we come to verse 46. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And that was his custom, wasn't it? It was his custom to be found early morning to pray to go off by himself to a secluded place and to pray. Have you ever considered that for a moment? That the Son of God, you know, this is the man, God-man, who spoke everything into existence. That was in every piece of creation by whom all things were made. He's praying to the Father. Did he need to pray? He was, he was God. He knew all things. Did he need to? Yet he does. Does God know my needs? Is God, is God uh, not decide to act in my life unless I pray? Well, he had to have acted in your life for you to even believe at all at some point in time, and usually that happened before you prayed. Yet we're called to pray. Jesus himself, with perfect communion with the Father, went to the mountain to pray. Then it was evening, and the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, I... <laughs> Verse 48 is where the majority of our time is going to remain. Seeing them straining at the oars. Is, is Jesus got the eyes of an eagle? Because I don't know about you, but he's on the mountain, and it's night, and they're in the middle of the sea, and he realizes he can see them straining at the oars. This is what I know. I can't tell you how he can see that far. I can't tell you. But he sees them. Are 
Are you straining at the oars? Because he sees you. The wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night. That's big. I don't think we understand how big that is. See, the fourth watch of the night was the period of time between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. 3 a.m. I'd like to read something for you. In folklore, the witching hour, or devil's hour, is a time of night that is associated with supernatural events whereby witches, demons, and ghosts are thought to appear and be at their most powerful defini definitions vary, including the hour immediately after midnight and a time between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. The term now has a widespread usage that is associated with human psychology and behavior to more superstitious phenomenon, even as luck. But the phrase, witching hour, began as early as 1775 in the poem Night and Ode by Reverend Matthew West, though its origins may go back even further during the Catholic Church, which prohibited activities during 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. time frame due to the emerging fears about witchcraft in Europe. In the Western Christian tradition, the hour between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. was considered a period of peak supernatural activity. This time is also referred to as the devil's hour due to it being a mocking inversion of the time in which Jesus supposedly died, which was at 3 p.m. The darkest hour. The witching hour. The darkest hour. The time when they were at their worst. They were fatigued beyond measure. It was it was dark. It was scary. There was no hope. He sees them. And he came to them. Psalm 130 verses 5 through 8 say these things about the watchman. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness. And with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his inequities. Psalm 36, 4 through 8. So I bless so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is sat satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. What I remember on my bed, I meditate in you in the night watches. For you have been, on my, you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your upright hand upholds me. Psalm 119, verses 147 through 148. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. My eyes anticipate the night's watches that I may meditate on your word. There is something about that hour that is important. One night at our last church, my son came bursting into the, that, my bedroom. And he was frightened because somebody was outside of our house in a car. They were parked. They had their headlights on. They were parked next to our vehicles in our parking spot. And I got up and I looked out and we were looking out the window trying to see what this man was doing and he was doing some kind of drugs at the time. And they were all frightened. 
And I was wondering if I should go out and confront him or what should I do. And he turned off the lights and he stayed there for a little while longer and then, then he backed up and he left just as quietly and smoothly as he came. We were all frightened. We weren't sure what to do. And, and I remember looking over at the stove and looking at the clock and it was 3 a.m. And the other night, I'm laying there and I'm wondering, why, Lord, do you allow me to, to kill myself in thought? Why can't you just take these thoughts from me? Maybe you feel that way sometimes. Maybe it's not just with your thoughts, but circumstances, I don't know. Why is it that we have to walk through the garbage of our life so often? And then out of nowhere, I could feel him in my, speaking to me in my head. He clarifying these thoughts, convicting me of things that I was thinking, putting to rest my soul as I'm reminded of how others have treated me and how I wasn't thinking of others the way I had been treated with kindness and mercy and grace. And as that was happening, what time is it? And I look, 3.02. I don't know where you are. But this I know. I don't care what Satan tries to claim to you. I don't care what this world tries to tell you. Satan has no claim. 3 a.m. is not his hour. And it's in that darkest hour when all hope seems to be lost, when we are at our weakest, that he is at his best. He came walking to them. It says here he intended to pass them by. It's actually an idiom that's used there. We would never think of that. It seems like we would think that maybe he meant to, uh, one commentary as he says it, he says it almost means that he meant to, to fool them, to sneak up on them. Maybe you read that and you think that he meant to go around them and for them not to see him. If Jesus didn't want to be seen, he wouldn't have been seen. I mean, they tried to throw him off a cliff, and it says he walked through them. They couldn't touch him. I mean, if he didn't want to be seen, he wouldn't have been seen. He wanted to be seen, but it wasn't just that he wanted to be seen. For that word that's used, that phrase that's used, is used three other times in Scripture, but not in the New Testament, in the Old. And you can write these down if you'd like, but they're from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, where it says, he passed by Moses. And this isn't when he passed behind him and covered him with his hand, but another time. And as he passed by him, God speaks in the first person about who he is and who he is to them. It's in Job chapter 9, verse 11. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. And in all of these things, it says, Yahweh passed by. Yahweh passed by. In their darkest hour, the God of the universe, of all creation, infinite power, infinite wisdom, ever present. In a place in space and time, walked by them in their need and reminded them, this is who I am. Of course, they were frightened. <laughs> of course they're frightened. 
Next time we're fishing, if I see a man walking on water to me, I'm going to be frightened. And as always, when the mediator between God and man comes to men, and we are frightened every single time this phrase is given, do not be afraid. O soul, are you wearied and troubled? Do not be afraid. And then the story of all creation, from the promises of Genesis to the future hope of Revelation, stood in the boat with them. He stood in the boat with them. Do you feel alone in your darkest, in your, in your worst moment, when you're straining at the oars? Do you feel alone? Jesus doesn't just give you his word and walk away. He gets in the boat. And if God is for us, what can be against us? What? For they had not gained any insight into the loaves. <laughs> and that's me. I'm, I'm verse 52, guys. I'm verse 52, right? God's doing this stuff, and I'm like, it's just numbskull, right? That's where that terminology comes from, I think. Just, you know, somebody throws something, you're supposed to catch it in your mouth, and it just, that's like Lambo, my dog. You just throw it at him, and then he picks it up off the ground. Catch it. No. That thing. That's me. That's me right there. I didn't get anything. Nope. See, if it was me, I'd be like, they didn't get anything. What am I even doing this for? I'm wasting my time. My time is precious. Right? Isn't that funny that the Lord's time is not his time, it's your time. That's how he sees his time. It's not even his time, it's your time. The Lord doesn't need anything. So everything the Lord does wasn't for him, it was for you. Everything the Lord does, right? It's not for him, it's for you. It's his time. But no, not really. No, it's your time. But see, to me, my time's my time. And I don't like to waste my time. What a world this would be if all time was somebody else's time instead of my time. And in all of that, he gets in the boat. He came to them on the water. You'll notice here, he doesn't stand on the shore and go, over here, guys. Safety, it's over here. And if it was me, it'd be like, what are you guys doing? That's my, that's my favorite phrase when I'm talking to my children, when I'm watching them do stuff. <laughs> Watching you guys like watching a circus. What are you doing? Another phrase that you'll often hear, or you guys won't hear it, but my kids have heard it. Engage your brain. <laughs> hey, get over here. You know? Numbskulls over here. Nope. He went there. And he just didn't go there. He got in the boat there. That's our God. That's our God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being you. Thank you for not leaving us to our own expectations of what we think you should be. For what a minimal God that would be if you met only our expectations. Thank you that you are faithful to yourself because you yourself are so much greater. Thank you for being what we need. 
when we need it every single time, Jesus. Give us a heart that sees it, cherishes it, and clings to it, O oh Lord. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Please rise. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.